Happy New Year! It's great to see you this morning on uh, January 1st, and I can't think of a better place to be than the house of the Lord on January 1st. It's great to see you here, and looking forward to a great service. Thank you, praise team. Just a few announcements uh, this morning. I was impressed on January 1st, early, we had 10 people this morning in uh, studying the book of Revelation. And if you haven't been able to uh, join us for that, we are in chapter 5 of the book of Revelation. 
And uh, please join us every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. After church this morning, Pastor is starting a new series today. And after church, we'll be meeting in the back to uh, discuss the sermon after our small break. Let's uh, keep in mind some of the Bible studies during the week. On Tuesday nights, we have Brothers in Bibles. There is no Wednesday night this week. Uh, that reas no, that reassumes January 4th, which is this week. <laughs> That was quick. That was quick. Where did time go? And then I know another announcement that Jim would really like us to, to promote is January 7th on Saturday, the, the church decorations come down at 9 a.m. So join us this Saturday, 9 a.m. for the Christmas decorations. Some of you, like myself, have been looking for the offering envelopes. And Renee has not been feeling well. Remember uh, her and, and your prayers? But th they're in, but they haven't been organized yet. So they'll be out next week. Next week, the church envelopes will be out in case you're wondering about that. But looking forward to a great day in the Lord's uh, house. I'm going to call the men to come forward for the offering. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are here this morning to exalt you, our King. We know that your truth shall reign forever and ever. And we're here this morning to give you honor and glory. So I pray for Pastor John as he starts a new series today, the start of a new year. I just pray, Lord, that we would open up our hearts to your message as it comes to us today through your word. I pray for our church. I pray that you'll continue to bless this church that we would spur each other on to good works, that we would continue to give you glory and be a shining light in this dark community and during dark times. So bless our church, and I pray that we would seek you first in everything that we do as we start this new year. We give you all the honor and the praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
be seated. Morning, Marin. Happy New Year. Guys, we, we are starting a brand new series today. We are, yeah, there's a lot going on. I, I had a realization that I've known, but you guys ever know something and then remember it and you, you know it again? You guys know what 2023 is for Berean? Uh, anniversary. Anniversary. 60 years. If you go out here into the, the foyer here in the, the, the little lobby, you'll see 1963 as when this building was built. Our building in us is 60 years of a legacy of faithfulness in our community. Do you guys know how awesome that is? Generations of people have come to faith in our little church, went on in a legacy and heritage of faithfulness. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to begin. I'm going to give you some intro to our series, where we're going, what we're doing, and then we're going we're gonna to get into it. So let's go ahead. Let me pray, and we'll get into it. Lord Jesus, you're gracious, glorious, kind, and wonderful. Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we look at the book of 1 Corinthians. Lord, I pray that you would illuminate our eyes to the scripture so that we would see you clearly, so that our hearts would be in, inclined to worship, that our theology would implicate or would impact our doxology. And Lord, hide me behind the cross as always. Draw a straight line with a crooked stick. And Lord, feed the people of God the word of God. It's in your good name. Amen. So 1 Corinthians, I've titled this entire book study, Correcting Bad Christians. Well, why would I use that tagline of this book? Why would I use that? Well, if you've ever read this book, it's clear that this little church had a lot of big problems, right? How many of you have read 1 Corinthians? How many of you poked through 1 Corinthians? You guys know that there's, guys, this church is jacked. <laughs> this church is jacked up. So examples include lawsuits amongst believers uh, not getting the Lord's Supper right. We're actually going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 11 when we partake of the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 5, a dude was shacking up and shagging his stepmom. Now, all of these problems are large problems. In all of these problems that this church was experiencing, all these crazy, like, oh my gosh, the, the, the problems that we would have, like, visceral reactions to, come from a lack of understanding the gospel. This church, Paul writing this letter to this church so that they would know Jesus better. And therefore, by knowing him better, by further drinking deep at the gospel, their theology would go from their heads to their hearts to their hands. That's what I'm hoping to do. So why, why is it a good idea that we go through this book? Why? Well, first, I want to point this out. This is not an admission that our church is dealing with any of the craziness that's going on in this book. There's no cases of stepmom church discipline here. I promise. There's nothing going, there's no, nothing behind door number three, promise. Um, however, there's several things that we would benefit from this book. One, we got to remember something. Discipleship, brothers and sisters, is a messy process. Discipleship is messy. Now, as we reach the people around us, as we reach people in our culture, as the gospel goes out, people, here's the whole gospel ministry formula. The gospel is preached, people meet Jesus, discipleship and organization is needed. It's a three-step process. It's very simple. We preach the gospel, the word of God uh, pierces the hearts of the people of God. They come to faith in Jesus Christ. They become saved. They repent of their sins. They trust in Jesus. Then we need organization and discipleship. Amen. Does that make sense? That's the process. That's the normative way of doing things. Now I want to point this out, especially with the messiness of discipleship. It's dark outside guys. It's, we live in a very dark culture. And let me just be honest here. There's a, there's a, there's a categorical difference between church culture and the actual culture. There's a massive separation. Now, I got to point some things out because, guys, I love the church. I'm a churchman. I, I pour, my, God willing, I'll pour the rest of my life out for the church. Go be with Jesus one day and then go worship with the, that section of the church. That's my life goal. My life goal is to preach the gospel until I'm dead. 
That's, there's no retirement here. Retirement's afterwards. That, that, that's awesome, by the way. The retirement for, for gospel faithfulness is lovely. So here's the thing with church culture. We usually are sanitized and more holy than the culture around us. This right here, I want to point this out. This is a good thing. The church needs to be holy. We need to be a reflection of who God is and what, what God is about. We need to be disciples of Jesus and, and holy people. Amen? Now, what happens is because of where we live currently, this chasm between the holiness of the church and the wickedness of the culture, this chasm is widening. Amen? Amen? And you don't have to do anything but turn on the television to figure out that this cat, that the, the world is getting more dark and more depraved on a daily basis. So this chasm is going to be growing greater. And so what, what, are, the, what are the challenges that come along with this? If the church is a holy place, which it should be, amen to the glory of God, there are some challenges that if we're in a Christian bubble, that they're going to present themselves. Let me say this. One, it, one, it creates a false sense of everyone's like us. That there's a consensus bias where we assume all people are like us. I want to make sure we don't do that. I want to make sure that we don't assume that everyone, I, I want us to know that the world is totally depraved. I preach, teach total depravity for a reason because it's biblical and it's true. Now, I've seen this illustrated Last year, when I was having a conversation with a dear brother, a dear brother, I seen this illustrated. We were, we were having breakfast, and I remember him telling him some things that were going on in a school system. There was a, I don't know if you guys have heard the, I don't know if you guys have heard of the, the Twitter handle libs of TikTok. Anyone ever heard of them? Like, <laughs> you see them, and they, they report the most crazy things, crazy things on the internet that people are saying about themselves. One of the things that I had pointed out to this brother was this one lady, she was in, she was a preschool teacher. This lady was clearly demonic, talking about how her and her preschool kids were doing, oh, we're talking about gender and consent and all these other like crazy woke things for preschoolers. I told, I was having a conversation with this brother. I was like, yeah, this is going on. He's like, no, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Hey, let me grab the video and show you. And then him looking at the video going, oh my gosh, it's going on. I want to make sure that we understand that we don't have some kind of confirmation bias or consensus bias that we think the world isn't more wicked, isn't less wicked than it actually is. Amen. And there's a reason I'm pointing this out because this is incredibly important. When we talk about sin, if we have a consensus bias that we assume the world is not as wicked as it is, when people talk about sin, we start getting a weird visceral reaction and we think that no one's committing that particular sin, right? Does that make sense what I'm saying? Like, for example, if we're in a Christian bubble and we assume that, we assume it would be weird to address a sin that no one is struggling with, right? Right? For example, cannibalism. I don't know if any of you guys struggle with cannibalism. I don't. <laughs> That's kind of creepy if I'm honest with you. Like, for example, if I preach a sermon, guys, you shouldn't eat people. Guys, you shouldn't eat people. I know there's like 10, every, I would be in the pew thinking if someone was preaching this, like, I'm not going to dinner at your house. That, no, that's weird. And that creates that, that there's a visceral reaction there, right? As there should be. Now, I'll give you where this is an honest, this is, this is where this becomes honest. I, with the way the world is, the world is more sinful than we would like to think. At my, most of my ministry has been discipling men in their 20s. From when I was in my 20s, every man in my 20s, and one of the things I've always seen with men in their 20s that I assume is the case is most of those men struggle with pornography. Most of those men struggle with internet pornography. I just assume it because I've seen it so much. Now, it's a rare, and I'm honest here, it's a rarity to assume that this is any, that, that a man isn't struggling. Now, I told this, just to give another illustration here, I told this to a, another brother and I talked to him about it. He's like, no one's struggling with that. Yeah, they are. 
Yeah, they are. There's a lot of guys who struggle with that. The world is very sinful. Now, I'm going to give an application here when we go through some of the sins in this book that this church was struggling with. One, don't shoot me. Don't shoot me. There's some, there's some crazy stuff in here. I'm not trying. My whole goal as we go through this is to be accurate to what the scriptures say. I, am, uh, I, I use the analogy of a shark cage. A preacher should stay within the text of scripture and preach only the text of scripture because there's safety in illustrating and preaching the text. Amen? So if the text says it, we say it. So I'm pointing this out. All scripture is God breathed and is helpful for correction and reproof, including the difficult passages. And there's several in this book. Now, this also should encourage us. This book should encourage us greatly because you know why? God saves the most messed up people. Our gospel gives, the, gives life, brings dead men back to life. There is no one so far gone that Jesus can't save them. The Apostle Paul, which we'll look at here in a moment, was say, he was a murderer, murderer. So this should make us preach the gospel with loud vigor, with fierce resounding, repent and know the Lord. God can save you, much like screaming to someone as they're about to go to their peril. Give you an example, one of my kids, I don't know if you guys have met Caleb, my, my young five, my six-year-old now. That kid likes to run. Like, he's like Dash from The Incredibles, just gone every which way. Well, this happens sometimes like in a parking lot when he'll run and I'll yell at the top of my lungs, Caleb, come back. You know, come. Why am I yelling? Why am I, why am I yelling with bold fierceness? Because he's in danger. He's in danger. That's how our posture should be with the culture sometimes is bold vigor for the gospel because the culture is in danger. Amen? Now, so God saves messed up people. And the other thing that we can really, really glory in is that sanctification is a process. Sanctification is a process. It's a pro process where we behold Christ and we become more like Jesus. Amen? No matter where you're at on the spectrum of sanctification, there's, there's, whether you're over here where you're just, you're a new Christian, you're a babe in Christ, and you're becoming more like Jesus, or if you're a senior saint who's looking toward heaven, you will be progressively sanctified as long as you walk with Christ. Amen? That's what this book shows us. Now, let's look at our text this morning. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 1, 1 to 9. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth and to those sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints together with all those who are in every place called upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because the grace of God that was given to you in Jesus Christ, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship of, into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Brothers and sisters, the word of the Lord. Now, let's look at verses one and two. Let's look at the first few verses of our text. So who wrote this book? Paul, the Apostle Paul. Well, who, who's Paul? Paul, he was originally named, just to give you some brief background information, Paul was originally named Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Jewish by birth, trained at the feet of this guy named Gamaliel. Well, Gamaliel was an early Jewish teacher, high ranking. This guy basically went to the Jewish equivalent of Harvard. Like, he was very well educated, very high status, up and comer. Like, he was, he was the guy. Well, the first martyr of the church, a man by the name of Stephen in the book of Acts, Paul is present at this martyrdom of this man and holds the coats of the people that were seeking, to, the people that killed Stephen. I mean, most people, if you guys witnessed a murderer, 
That's not going to, but that's going to horrify you, right? And who's going to be horrified? I'm going to be horrified. A murder? You, hey, guys, you killed someone. That doesn't do that for Paul. That actually emboldens him to go to the synagogue and ask for letters to go persecute Christians at Damascus. Well, Jesus meets Paul on the road of Damascus, and he becomes a Christian there. Jesus knocks him off his horse, strikes him blind. A man by the name of Ananias shows up a few days later, restores his sight to him. And God, or Jesus, by the grace of God, makes him one of the best missionaries in the first century and writer of most of the individual works of the New Testament. For those of you who were here last week and we looked at Luke and the Christmas story, the, the most volume of the New Testament was written by Luke, the Gentile doctor. The most number of works in the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul. There's a whole thing in, in church history of all the letters put together with the Pauline corpus. Most books in the New Testament were written by this apostle. Well, we see Paul and we see who else? Sosthenes, this guy that was there. So who's Sosthenes? Well, he's probably the former ruler of the Jewish synagogue mentioned in Acts 18, 17. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galeo paid no attention to any of this, right? So he's, he's in the city of Corinth and a member of the city of Corinth. So these people, the Corinthian church would have knew exactly who this guy was. Now, why do I think this is the same guy? Well, most of the commentators I've read this week have said that, so that gives me real good credence. Second, he would have been known to the city of Corinth. For example, if I went on a trip, if we went on, me and all, some of the elders went on vacation, and we wrote a letter back to the church. I say, hey guys, uh, Pastor John, Steve, Jim, Bruce, and Dave, we're all glad to see you. Do you guys need to know who I'm talking You guys know who I'm talking about, right? If I say, hey, Dave, we know it's Dave Mullenkamp. If I say, Steve, we know it's probably Steve Bosla. Bruce, probably Bruce now. I mean, Jim, Jim Dyke. We know who these people are. Like, you don't need me to put the last name of the guy because you would know him. Amen? Makes sense. So he's working here with Paul and is a companion of Paul. Now, Paul writes to this church by the will of God, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth. He's writing to this church in Corinth. Well, where's Corinth? Where's Corinth? Corinth is a port city located in Greece. You'll see a picture here, which we'll see here in a moment. Uh, which I'll explain here in a moment. That's actually modern Corinth, and there's a reason I picked this instead of ancient Corinth. Now, Corinth's claim to fame in the old, in, in the old world, in the ancient world, was this thing called Diakolos. This Diakolos thing was, was a paved track near Corinth. So Corinth sits geographically on an isthmus, right? Kind of like a peninsula, southern Greece. So what they would do in Corinth during this Diakolos, they would take ships and they would portage them, right? There would be a road basically where that canal is right there and they would take the ships, put them on rollers and then walk them right across this little teeny weeny little isthmus so that the ships didn't have to go around the whole isthmus of Corinth, that the whole peninsula. They didn't have to, that was a shortcut. In the ancient world, in, they used this for shipping, for cargo, naval ships. There was a Greek phrase that they used to use called as fast as Corinth. Corinth was a port city where this whole kind of industry sprang up because they could easily get ships from one area to another on this paved Diakolos road. Now, this canal right here that you guys are seeing, this is modern day Corinth. Well, they don't, have a, they don't have a road there anymore. They're not portaging ships and saying, okay, let me grab the naval tanker and we'll just roll it through. No, they actually dug a canal. So now that's pretty much where the Diakolos was. They, they use that instead of the old ancient road. Now, <clears throat> so location, it's an urban port city. Well, what about the culture of Corinth? What, what's going on in Corinth? Well, the culture was formed by being a big thriving city. So this, imagine how this is. This is a thriving city. This is kind of an industry, usually within cities, industry brings people around. Like, for example, my mom, my mom's family is from Kentucky. 
My dad's family is from Michigan. Do you know why my mom migrated from Kentucky to Michigan? Work, the auto industry. She came from this area to go to the Michigan because she was looking for work. Work and industry and things like that brings people from all over, right, to work in certain locations. So economically speaking, because of the things going on in this city, there was a whole hodgepodge of people that showed up. Economically, there's sailors. So this is a, becomes a natural hub for ideas, for people. That's actually where, like cities. Detroit became a natural hub for people to come to because of looking for work. Does that make sense? You guys tracking along? Good. Now, the thing we got to realize about ancient Corinth, not only was it economically, like with commerce and things like that, forming a culture, but it comes out of Greek paganism. I don't know if you guys know anything about Greek, the Greek gods and Greek worship. Most people in ancient Greece were this thing called pantheists. They believed in multiple gods. They believed in multiple different, different, they were religiously pluralistic. For example, you might have a temple to Zeus, a temple to Poseidon, and a temple at Aphrodite in the same area, and they would think that is normal, right? Very pluralistic. Cultures like this still exist, like our Hindu friends are very pluralistic. They have multiple gods. Well, this is antithetical to everything that the scriptures teach, because there's only one God in scripture, and he has three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, Culture gets shaped from, from paganism in this city. So in this city, there was one main God worshiped and several lesser deities that were worshiped. So typically within Greek city-states, they would have one, one God, little G, not big G, one little God that they would worship, and then they would have little kind of minor things going on. For example, the city of Sparta, the uh, Spartan city-state. Who do you think they worshiped? Ares, the, the god of war. They're Spartans, although they would have tiny other temples. In Greece, however, do you know who their main god? In, in Corinth, do you know who their main god was? They're a shipping state. The Greek god Poseidon. So the Greek god Poseidon was the god of the sea, typically sailors, right? Shipping port sailors. They would worship him in the, the false deity Poseidon in this area. There's actually a large temple that was built in this city toward, but there's ruins of this temple still to this day of the temple of Poseidon in the city of Corinth. This thing was massive, by the way. This thing was built hundreds of years before the coming of Christ because the pagans were still pagan out. Now, what other deities were worshiped in the city? Well, Aphrodite, Athena, Apollos, Demeter, um, Hera. So one of these names, well, one of these things that should pop out at you, so Aphrodite is, so how she was worshipped is, so she was considered the goddess of love and how they typically worshipped love for them was not like love for us. One of the things going on in this city was religious prostitution. So think sailors, prostitution. This is a real bad place, guys. This is a real bad place. And, I, and which was, this was common in Greece. Now, I want to make an important observation. I'm not just telling you this cultural stuff just to, just to fill your brains, but I want to set some context as we go to this book. This is rather important. An important observation. Understanding where the people were coming from, from the Greek context explains why the church had such problems that they did because they were saved from this, saved from this cesspool into new life. Like some of the problems that they were having were mere images of the culture that they came from. So much of, this is massive impact on the way that we do ministry. This is massive impact. So what do I mean? How does this, how does this, what does this mean for us when we do ministry? Well, one, people have messy lives. And we shouldn't be shocked when we call sinners to repentance that it takes time for the Holy Spirit to clean up their lives. We shouldn't be shocked by that. Now, we pray for new converts, amen? 
Amen. I pray that we reach the entire, the city of Livonia, Wayne County, Michigan, United States, the world. I pray that the gospel goes forth in such powerful ways that it changes everything. Amen. Who's, who's praying this with me? Okay, everyone's not, okay, some people aren't raising your hands, guys. I'm a little concerned. No, here's the thing. I want the gospel to go out, but you know what this produces when the gospel goes out? This is joyous. This is joyous because souls are saved. But you know what this also is? Hard. This is hard because people now needs to be People need to be discipled. Imagine, guys, all the empty chairs in this room. Imagine if every empty chair was filled with a brand new convert. Who would, who would, I want to throw a party for that. I would love to see that happen. If we had all, like, no more chairs because people are, people have met Jesus. You know what that also tells us? We got a lot of work to do. Having new disciples is like having babies. Now, I'm going to throw this out. Babies are joyous, but guess what babies also are? messy. Babies are messy. Every one of my kids at some point or another has decided to take their diaper off and decorate. Let's just use that word. Lives are messy. Lives are messy. So when we see new converts, we shouldn't be shocked that their lives are messy, but we should lovingly, graciously present the gospel to them and disciple them to be more like Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, this church, so it's writing to the church. Well, there's gospel ministry that has been going on to this area. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts 18. I want to read briefly 16 verses so that I know, I know, I give you a false sense of security there when the, when the text was big. Now it's, now it's an eye chart. Now, let's read through here. I want to look at as much text as we can to see how this church was planted. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila and a native of Pontius. Recently came from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks." When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named uh, Tidius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent for I'm with you and no one will attack you or harm you for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gileo was uh, proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gileo said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of question about words and names and your own law, I see see it to yourselves. I refuse to be judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal and all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galeo paid no attention to any of this. So what's going on in this text? Well, we see the gospel... We see spiritual reformation. We see Paul going to the Gentile, or Jews first. The Jews reject the gospel. And then Paul going to the Gentiles to preach the gospel. Well, this is incredibly important because these Gentiles that he's preaching to are these pagan, these pagan Greeks. And these pagan Greeks are hearing the full counsel of God. You're seeing the gospel go forth in power. And Paul spends a year and six months preaching here and pastoring this little church. So what happens socially? So we have a spiritual reformation. There's some social stuff that happens too because of the gospel going out. Well, it stirs up the Jews and they bring Paul before this tribunal. Now, I want to point this out. They're 
claim against Paul that his preaching of Jesus is against the Mosaic law. That's not true. Mosaic law, as we've seen during the Christmas season, points to Jesus. Jesus is the big picture of the entire Bible. Now, very interesting here that I kind of want to point out was like a side note. You know what they're trying to do to silence the preaching of the gospel? They're trying to use the power of the government to shut down the preaching of the gospel. There's an act, there's a, there's a point we shouldn't be, shouldn't miss here. We shouldn't be surprised as our culture gets darker that those, the enemies of the gospel would try to use the government to shut down churches. That's never going to happen. Every Sunday, I'm going to be preaching, whether we're standing under a tree, we're in somebody's basement, no matter what, this thing keeps moving. Amen? Amen. And if, God forbid, I get locked up, we got other people, other men in the bullpen that'll open the same book, preach the same word, and we'll be here until Jesus gets back. Amen? Amen? Now, so what happens here, what happens here is we see the Roman governor, God providentially for his people, the Roman governor Galeo does nothing and lets the church remain. This is awesome. This is exactly kind of what happened during the COVID lockdowns where the government relented with a man by the name of John MacArthur out in California. They actually ended up getting, get, getting blessed and getting more money for their church so that they could do ministry than if they would have just not stayed faithful. So the principle here is we stay faithful no matter what. Now, let's look at our text back in 1 Corinthians. Let's look at 5, 2, 9. So Paul, how does Paul feel about these brothers and sisters? How does Paul feel about them? Well, he's thankful for them and the grace that have been shown in the gospel. Most of Paul's letters, I'm going to be level with you guys. Most of Paul's letters, Paul is thankful for the people that are, that he's writing to. Now, pointing this out, that's not a throwaway word. That's not a throwaway. There is no, no, no portion of scripture is just there for no reason at all. This is not, and also this isn't just pleasant, nice and trees, right? Do you know how when, like when you correct somebody, you usually give them a compliment and then you sandwich it? Compliment, criticism, compliment, it's easier for them to swallow. That's not kind of what's going on here. Paul seems to be legitimately thankful for what God has done for these brothers and sisters and done in their lives and through them. Now, why is Paul thankful for the believers in Corinth? Well, the grace of God was shown to them in Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. Well, what is the type of grace is Paul referring to? Well, their faith in Jesus Christ and their salvation because they repented of their sins and trusted in Christ. This is an overarching theme of Paul's gratitude to the Lord for them. Now, why might this be something Paul is thankful for? Why? Why would you be thankful for someone's salvation? Because it's an absolute miracle that someone comes to Jesus. This is one of the weird things I get with my charismatic brothers. They, they like to see miracles. We see miracles all the time when someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ. God rips out the heart of stone, gives them a heart of flesh. That is a supernatural thing that no one else can do. It takes God to open the eyes. We preach the gospel faithfully, but it takes God to open the eyes. This is for Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. If you came to faith in Jesus, it's not because you're awesome. I assure you, you're not. I'm not. You, we came to faith in Jesus because of the grace of God that was manifested to us for ultimately his glory and our good. Amen? Amen. Now, how was this grace demonstrated? How was this grace demonstrated? They came to faith. How was it demonstrated? We see here, they were enriched in speech, which is the ability to communicate that which is known. A few commentators I read this week said that there might've been a really great bullpen of preachers here in Corinth and these people and or kind of could be both. They were really bold for the proclamation of the gospel in the city. I mean, Paul himself was bold when he preached to them in Acts. Now, other things, there was enriched in speech and in knowledge. 
They know what is true about God. These believers were probably very gifted in their theological understanding of who God was. Now, this is good. This is good because we need to have an accurate picture of who God is. Theology is awesome because it is the study of God himself. It, to quote one of my, theolo- my dead theological heroes, James Pettigrew Boyce, it is the chiefest of the sciences. Theology is wonderful, but the problem is with too much theology is if it doesn't go from your head to your hearts to your hands, the whole system gets clogged up. So what tells me here about this church is that their, their theology, especially their giftings, Like, we know something about this. Information that they had did not lead to transformation. Information does not always lead to transformation, brothers and sisters. We can know things about God. We can know things about God. But if it doesn't impact from our head to our hearts to our hands, it's not beneficial. Amen? Amen. There's atheists out there that know more about the Bible than than me, than your elders. There's atheists out there that know more about Scripture and they don't care. I mean, demons know about Scripture and James says what? Don't you know that there's one God? Demons know the same thing and tremble. It's not about knowing God just intellectually but also in our hearts. Now, I want to give an important note here. Information is necessary for transformation, but it doesn't necessarily equal it. We need to know things about God. You need to know theology. Everyone's a theologian. Just a question tonight if you're biblical. Everyone, we need to be biblical. And also, I don't want you to hear when I say information does not equal transformation that I think information is unimportant because theology is incredibly important because we need to worship our God accurately. Amen? We need to worship him accurately. But let us not just know about someone, but actually know him. Guys, I know a lot of facts about my wife. I know she's 5'3", she wears glasses. Um, Her favorite color used to be teal, but it's changed since then because that was one of our wedding colors. Um, I can tell you all kinds of facts about her. That doesn't mean that I know her. We need to not just know facts about God, but we need to know God. Now, what this means for us is we should seek information for transformation. We should seek information for transformation. And I'll give you guys an important caution here. If you're growing in your information for God, but not growing in your godliness, there's a real problem. Growing in your information about God, but not growing in your personal holiness, there's a problem. It's like a clogged toilet. I mean, seriously, there's a clog somewhere between the head, the heart, and the hands. Like a, like a toilet. You got a clogged toilet? There's a problem there. Oh, oh, catastrophic things can... I have four children. A toilet gets clogged. Catastrophic things happen. Same thing in our discipleship. If you have a clog in between your head to your hearts to your hands, you're going to know a lot about God, but you're going to be ungodly. In fact, I, I would... I would say you're going to reap more a stricter judgment because you know not to do something or you know to do something and you're not doing it. Amen? So we should be reading our Bibles, praying regularly, fellowshipping with the saints, but we also should be growing in personal holiness and, uh, and our love for Christ. Amen? Now, so what does Paul say about Jesus in this text? We see him say he's thankful for them. You're a very gifted church. You you know a lot. Your your speech, knowledge, your giftings are great. But Paul says something very important about Jesus Christ in in this text. I think this is very important for us too as we walk with Christ. Paul says he will sustain us till the end. Now, I really... This points to something that the ref- I, all my cards on the table. I live in the Reformed camp. This is one points to the re- one of the Reformed doctrines of the perseverance of the saints, which I'm going to lay my cards on the table. Next October, I'm really contemplating. I'm praying through this, and if you'd pray for me, I would appreciate that about preaching through the doctrines, what is known as the doctrines of grace. Um. I, this is the perseverance of the saints is the P in the acronym TULIP, 
which is, which is one of my favorites, if I'm honest. Now, this doctrine of perseverance of the saints is categorically different than something theologians would call once saved, always saved. Now, I believe you cannot lose your salvation. Do you know why you cannot lose your salvation? Because it didn't depend on you in the first place. Your salvation, the only thing you contributed to your salvation was the sin that made it necessary. Salvation beginning to end is from the Lord himself. Salvation is from the Lord. We did nothing. God did everything. Now, once saved, always saved. This is why this is categorically different. Once saved, always saved teaches that you can live however you want if you pray a prayer to Jesus. I think that's wicked. Because if you believe that there's a heaven, you should not live like you're going to hell. I'm just telling you the truth. Now, with the perseverance of the saints, I want to define this because the sustaining grace of Jesus. If you're really in Christ, you will persevere till the end. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. But if we're in, you're in Christ, you will persevere till the end because God will sustain you. Now, Romans 8, 25 to 31, which contains one of the most glorious texts of all of scripture for me, the golden chain of redemption. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. You know what's in this text, brothers and sisters? You know what's not in the, rephrase that. You know what's not in this text? Dropouts. There's no dropouts. If you're really in Christ, you will persevere till the end. You may have, you may have dark times. You may have times where you're, that, that, that walk with Christ becomes a crawl. That crawl becomes a, a slow drag, but you eventually will persevere till the end if you are in Christ because salvation is not from you, it's from God. Salvation is not from you. If your eyes are really opened and you're really, really saved in Christ, you will persevere. We must, we must see this. Because this, brothers and sisters, does something to our hearts. When we look at the sustaining grace of Jesus, this right here, this doctrine, the perseverance and the whole doctrines of grace, you know what this is for me? I'm just gonna be real personal, real vulnerable right now. You know what this is for me? This is a warm blanket on a cold winter day. That, yes, we work toward being more like Christ. Yes, we actually put effort into following Jesus but I don't have to worry about my salvation because it's in God's hands. I don't have to worry about, um, am I gonna be good enough? Am I gonna be righteous enough? But Jesus already, did. is something bad going to happen to me where I'm gonna not love Jesus anymore? No, it's not. I'm in Christ and no matter what happens, I'm firmly in Christ and those, that no one can snatch any of us out of the Father's hand, amen? Now, what this should produce in us, this should produce peace, in us. The sovereignty of God, that God is completely in control, should bring us peace. For example, the world feels crazy right now, doesn't it? The world feels crazy right now. The world doesn't know up from down, left from right, back to forward. It's like everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. God hasn't God will sustain us. Christ will sustain us through all of this. I don't know what the future is going to hold. I can't tell you for certain what's going to happen in the future, but you know what? I know the one whom is in the future with us, and his name is Jesus Christ. And one day, brothers and sisters, through many dangers, toils and snares, for those of us that are in Christ, we will be with him in eternity. Amen? And he will bring us through. He will see us through whatever dark times we could whatever dark times, personal, corporate, that we could possibly see, he will bring us through. Amen? We have to cast our cares on the Lord. And this should let us rest in his sovereignty, guys. We should rest in the sovereignty of our God because not one hair on our head turns white or black without him knowing and fully controlling it. God is in control of everything. So, 
But if you're here today and you've heard me talk about Jesus, you've heard me talk about these things, let me explain to you the gospel, the, 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 sal- the message of salvation that these believers in Corinth profess to believe. Jesus lived, came in flesh. God, second member of the Trinity, came in flesh to live a perfect life, to die a brutal death in your place and for your sins, in my place and for my sins, to save us, to remove the wrath of God from us. And how we embrace this gospel is we repent. We turn from our sins, we trust in Christ, and we become a brand new creation. We might, we're not gonna be all there we're not going to be perfect. So this journey of becoming, when we meet Jesus, this, we get salvation, but through the rest of our lives, we get sanctification and we get corrected. We learn about Jesus in scripture and he corrects us. Amen. Let's go ahead and let's pray. And then we'll transition to a time where we're proclaiming the death of the Lord through communion. Lord Jesus, you're gracious, glorious, kind, and wonderful. Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we celebrate your your death and we celebrate uh, and proclaim the resurrection. Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we look as we look at the book of 1 Corinthians to our good and your glory. It's in your good name, Lord. Amen. I'll go ahead and I'm going to have the men come forward for our time of communion. But before we start our time of communion, I do have to read a text from the book of 1 Corinthians. What we do around here is every time we partake of communion, I do this thing of fencing the table. It's not a wall, it's a fence. And I do this for good reason. Because if you're here today and you love Jesus and you're, you're following Jesus, you've repented of your sins, we welcome you to the table. We welcome you to the Lord's table. If you're here today and you're not a Christian and you're not in Christ, we love you. We're glad you're here visiting. We're glad you're here with us today. But this isn't for you. This isn't for you. This is something we take very seriously. Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 to the end of the chapter, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. For whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. I'm not saying God's going to kill someone in this service. What I am saying is before we take the elements, we should really seriously inspect our lives. We should examine ourselves before we come to the Lord's table. Amen? Amen. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to have the men pass out the bread and we'll partake. But during this time, have some quiet prayer, some time of reflection to your relationship between you and the Lord.
Verse 23 again, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and we had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, the body of Christ. And in the same way, he took the cup as we pass out the other elements. same way he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me brothers and sisters the blood of the Lord we have a we have a tradition around here in Berean that every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we take a benevolence offering. So before we leave and go in the back, you'll see a plate back there. Not a compulsion. No one's going to shake it down. No one's going to patch it. It's not like airport security. Don't, don't worry about that. But if the, as the Lord moves, we like to do charitable things around here to Berean for, our mem- for member care, for benevolence, whenever the Lord gives opportunity. And this is what we use that for. So... Yeah, if, if the Lord spurs you on, that's what it's there for. Now, as you can clearly see, Timothy is not here to lead us in the final song. So he asked me right before to, uh, to lead the doxology. So we're going to, if everyone would stand, we can sing, and we can sing the doxology. And you can real understand right now why I don't lead worship. The person in my household that sings is my wife. So let's go ahead and we can sing the doxology and be dismissed and we can, we can go serve our king. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Brothers and sisters, go serve your king.